Well, good morning. I, uh, I can't tell you how much it delights me to see all of these faces here this morning. Um, one word just keeps resounding, a, a family. You know, my brother's here, and uh, Micah's family is here, and Jan's family is here, and Tina is here with their baby. Uh, and so it is just uh, a joy to see you know, people's families here. Um, so thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, this morning we're going to be in Exodus chapter 19. So if you turn in your Bible there to Exodus 19, verse 7 to 25. We've been going through Exodus for several months now. <clears throat> the title of the sermon this morning is Approaching an Unapproachable God. So uh, as you're flipping there, um, <clears throat> we'll uh, read the text and then open this in a word of prayer and then we'll jump into the uh, sermon this morning. Um, <clears throat> actually, you know what, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to save time this morning so that uh, we can get to the more of the sermon. Uh, so let me just open this in a word of prayer directly and uh, I'll read the text as we go along piece by piece. I think that'll be better for us. So uh, <clears throat> please pray with me. <clears throat> Father, I just thank you for um, that we get to gather here um, as a family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, some of us biological family and some of us family through adoption, um, through the, the kingdom that you have adopted us into and made us your sons and daughters and brothers and sisters. Um, Lord, it is, it is such a privilege to be called your family, to be called your son, to be called your daughter, to be called a, um, a member and a co-heir with Christ. Lord, we, that's why we're here, God. We're here to praise uh, your glory and just what you have accomplished through your son, Jesus Christ. Um, so Lord, I pray that you would help us to just fix our, our thoughts and our affections on this this morning. Uh, to, to, to see Jesus for the glorious King that He is. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you have ever seen the movie The Wizard of Oz, and some of you may have not seen that, it was back in 1939. Uh, if you remember at the end of the movie, if you've never seen it, I'm going to ruin it for you. Um, if you remember at the end of the you're about 80 years past due in seeing it. Um, if you've never seen the movie, uh, at the end of the movie, uh, there's this wizard who's like this great, majestic, scary figure, uh, and they're all scared to see him. The whole like, kingdom is scared to see him. And uh, it turns out that Toto kind of goes behind this curtain and sees this uh, man who's behind the curtain. And, and it turns out the wizard is nobody. It's just, it's just a man pretending to be somebody great and glorious and majestic. And they're like, you're the wizard? You're not anybody to be scared of. You're, you're just a man. And he's like, you're right, like I, I am. Um, that is not how it is with God. In fact, I think sometimes we're tempted to have the opposite effect with God. That sometimes we kind of treat God or think of God as like this buddy or this, you know, weak past the person that we can just casually go in and out with. And, he, you know, he's just God and, and we can neglect him or treat him casually and we kind of think of him as the man behind the curtain with while failing to realize he is a God to be terrified of. It's the exact opposite effect. So this morning we're going to look at a text that kind of will help us, I hope, to kind of think soberly about who God is and, and, and how should we relate to him, okay? So stay with me here. We're going to read through the text uh, verse by verse, and then I'll have points with this, and, and hopefully God will teach us about how do we approach an unapproachable God. So it's Exodus 19, beginning in verse 7. Uh, so Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Now last week we looked at the words that God had given Moses on top of Mount Sinai, God had told uh, Moses uh, to go tell the people to obey my voice, to keep my covenant. And if they do this, 
They will become my segula. Remember, I, I gave you that word last week. It means treasured possession. God says that out of all the people of the earth, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, out of everybody, you, Israel, will be my segula, my treasured possession, if you do this. But God had called them to be also a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And then God told Moses, go and deliver this message to the people. All right, so in verse 7, Moses does this. He calls the elders together and, and gives them this message that God had spoken to him. Now, the reason that Moses has to deliver this message to the people is because he's God's prophet. I want to point out that Moses is God's prophet. And at this point, he's God's only prophet. God does not speak directly to the people. He speaks to Moses and only Moses, and Moses relays God's messages to the people. And even when God does speak to Moses, Moses has to climb a mountain for God to be willing to speak with him. Notice in verse 3, Moses goes up the mountain to meet with God. Verse 7, Moses comes down the mountain. Verse 8, Moses goes up the mountain. Verse 14, Moses goes down the mountain. Verse 20, Moses goes up the mountain. Verse 24, Moses goes down the mountain. I mean, I imagine Moses had some really nice calves. Calves that would make Tony Little envious. Uh, Y'all don't know who Tony Little is. Um, have we ever considered that we as New Testament Christians get to approach God whenever and wherever we like? We no longer have to climb a mountain to talk to God. We just have to open a closet. We no longer have to go to a prophet to discern the will of God for us. We have been given the Spirit of God Himself in us to discern His will. I pray that we don't take that for granted. I pray that we don't take the easy access, the direct access that we have to God for granted. Moses had to climb a mountain to hear from God one time and then come back down and go back up. What an unbelievable privilege that as New Testament Christians, we can meet with God whenever and wherever we want. Verse 8, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Now this is an interesting statement by the people. The people basically tell Moses, we will obey. We will do what God has told us to do. Now, uh, it's interesting because only 13 chapters later in chapter 32, they don't obey. The people don't. 13 chapters later, they are building their golden calf while Moses is working on his calves. We learn from the Old Testament and our lives that we want to obey God. We, we do, right? God tells us to go and do X. It's like, I want to go and do X. Or God says, don't go and do Y. And we're like, I don't want to go do Y. But sometimes the carrying out of that proves to be much more difficult. The people said, we, we will obey. We will do this. And just 13 chapters later, they don't. There will be many more times that the people promise to keep God's covenant. And they say, well, we will keep this. We will do it. And then they will fail to keep it. Nevertheless, Moses goes back up the mountain to report the words to the Lord, to tell the God, say, God, your people have said they will obey you. Now, I want to make it clear that, that uh, uh, this isn't because God didn't know what they said. This is not like, you know, like God's waiting on top of the mountain, like, what'd they say, Moses? God knows what they said. God knows what their answer was. I, I, I think that the whole reason that Moses is, is doing this, and God has him do it, is to teach the people two things. All right, number one, that God could not be approached by just anybody. God had to be willing to condescend himself, to, to lower himself, to talk to a human. And, he was all, and it was only a human that he was willing to do it to. God was teaching the people that you can't just go run up Mount Sinai and talk to me. It doesn't work that way. God said, nobody approaches me unless I say so. Number two, God was teaching the people to rely upon God and his process of doing things. You know, I, I know it seems silly to kind of have Moses go up and down this mountain relaying messages. I mean, it seems kind of silly, right? Not, not as silly as using a dishwasher for a drying rack, but 
silly. But this was God's ordained process to do things. Much like marching around a city for seven times. God told them, march around the city seven times and then the walls will fall down. That sounds ridiculous, does it not? But it's what God told them to do. If there's one thing that we learn about God's commands and scriptures is that they don't have to make sense in our head to be obeyed. God's commands do not have to make sense to be obeyed. I think this is part of the problem that we have with obedience. We kind of think, if God's command makes sense in my head, then I'll do it. If it doesn't make sense, I have a right to question it. It's not how it works. This is not all that different from prayer. Have you ever wondered why does God command us to pray when he knows what we need already? He already knows what we're thinking. Jesus said, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Well, if he knows what we need, then why command us to pray? You know, I've thought about that before. It's like I have like an hour, I only have an hour of free time, and it's like, well, I could pray. Well, he already knows what I need. Why do I, why do I need to spend the time, God? Why does God make us, you know, why does God make Moses go up and down the mountain? Is he really concerned about Moses toning his calves? I think God is teaching his people to rely upon him to do things the way that he commands them to be done. God knows what we need. He, he knows the desires and the intentions of our heart, the motives, but God has chosen only to work through prayer. And here's the beauty. We're no longer dependent upon Moses to go to God in prayer. We no longer have to go up a mountain to talk to God. Imagine if every time you wanted to talk to God, you had to climb a mountain. I mean, right now, we just got to go to a closet, and it's difficult. Imagine having to climb a mountain every time you wanted to talk to God. We no longer have to do that. We have a more faithful high priest than Moses in Jesus. Jesus has given us direct access to God Almighty, to the King, in prayer. Now, if that doesn't, like, blow us away... Think about just for a moment. Can you imagine if whenever you had a problem with Windows, like you could just call up Bill Gates or whoever the CEO of Microsoft is and be like, hey man, I got a problem. Windows, my, my Windows 10 is still not downloaded on my computer. When am I getting this, Bill? Or if you had a problem with Facebook, you know, you could call up, hey, Zuck, man, what, like, can you get rid of these ads, please? Or if you're waiting on your Amazon package, like, Jeff, come on, man, where's my package? Jeff Bezos, in case you're not familiar. Chris knows who that is. Far too well. We have somebody far greater, far more powerful, far more loving than Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos. We have direct access to God Almighty. I hope we're not taking that for granted. Verse 9a, and the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and you may believe forever. Now, I believe that God is looking out for Moses here because, you know, here's, here's why. I, imagine if we, we went on to the retreat. We just got back from the retreat. We went to Mount Rainier. Imagine we went to Mount Rainier and I told you guys, hey guys, see that peak up there? I'm gonna go climb that peak, all right? And I went and climbed the peak and then I came back and I told you guys, hey guys, I, I, I talked to God, like audibly. Like he spoke audibly to me, I spoke audibly to him, I heard him. You might be like, uh, I think the thin air is getting to you, Matt, right? God tells Moses that he's going to speak to him through a thick cloud, but he's gonna do it in such a way that the people will audibly hear God speaking to Moses loud enough, why? So, so that when Moses tells the people, hey guys, God told me this, they will believe him. They will believe that Moses is not just making this up. Now today, we don't get to hear the audible words of God. We don't. Uh, we can't just go climb a mountain and have God speak audibly to us. I know, I've tried. I wanted to see if it would happen. I've gone to a top of a mountain. I was like, God would, like just once, could I, like, I didn't hear anything audibly 
but we have something just as good. We have something just as good. We have the words of God recorded and preserved in Scripture for us. Now listen to me. I pray that you believe that these words that are written here in this book are just as profitable as if God spoke to you audibly. Because here's why. If you believe that, you will read this book. If you don't believe that, I imagine you will find great difficulty having motivation to read this. There is nothing more relevant, helpful, and exciting to read than this. That is a fact, whether you feel it or not. Verse 9 through 11. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Now God gives Moses these instructions to consecrate the people. Now the word used here for consecrate, it's the same Hebrew word for holy. So God is basically saying, You shall make the people holy. Now, making them holy is basically the idea of making them acceptable to God or approachable to God. But notice something here. There's an implied statement by God when he says this. The fact that God says, go and consecrate them or go make them acceptable, what does that imply? That implies that they are unacceptable to God. You know, there's a lot of uh, Christian buzz phrases that kind of float around out there. Uh, you may have heard them on the radio or re you'll read them in books or you may have even said them before. I know I have said them before in the past. Kind of things like, God accepts everybody. Depending on what you mean by that, that's not true. God accepts you as you are. Depending on what you mean by that, that's not true. I was, uh, I was watching a documentary this week on uh, MMA and Christianity. It was called uh, Fight Church. And um, as I was watching this, it was kind of trying to weave together MMA and, and uh, Christianity and how the two are compatible. I, I disagree. I don't think they are. But uh, it was trying to talk about how they're compatible. And there was this predominant theme that was woven through the documentary. And it was this. We just tell people to come as they are. Listen, it's fine to tell people to come as they are. It's not fine for them to stay as they are. We are not fit in and of ourselves to approach God. We are not acceptable to God as we are in our state apart from Him. Now let me make it clear that there was nothing special in and of itself in washing these clothes. God is not a germaphobe or a clean freak or he's like, oh, I hate dirt, right? I, I, I believe this command to wash their clothes, it's, it's more pedagogical and symbolic in nature. I think the people is to teach, the, I think the point is to teach them that they can't just approach God as they are. God is a loving God. He is merciful. He is kind and compassionate, abounding in steadfast love, but he will by no means clear the guilty. God is not just this great big puppy dog that just loves you all the time, no matter what, and just accepts you. That's not who God is. If you have never been made holy, if you have never been consecrated by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're banking on God's forgiveness when you stand before Him, He'll forgive me. I pray you will change your perspective this morning. 
If you have never been consecrated, if you have never been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ, and, and you are banking on God saying, you are basically a good person. I pray you will change your perspective this morning. And the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus, this is Jesus saying this, not Old Testament God, Jesus. They're one and the same, by the way. Jesus said, but when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him in the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. You see, Scripture teaches us that our garments must be consecrated. Our garments are not consecrated by nature. They must be. We cannot approach God in and of ourselves. Why? We are born with filthy rags. That's what we're born with. We're born with utterly disgusting, filthy rags, and God will not accept them. We cannot approach God with these filthy rags. No matter how much we think God is loving or merciful, these rags that we're born with must be made clean, must be consecrated, must be made holy. And the blood of Jesus is the only laundry detergent that works. Period. Verse 12 to 13. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up to the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. God's holiness was and is so great, so glorious, so dreadful that limits had to be placed around this mountain. Basically, a border had to be placed around the mountain. The people are not allowed to go up the mountain. They're not even allowed to touch the mountain. Even animals are not to touch the mountain. If they do touch the mountain, God commands them to put that person to death. Even if a donkey steps foot on the mountain, you are to stone or shoot that donkey. This is the dreadful holiness of our God. Capital punishment for touching a rock. Remember Uzzah? They're bringing the ark back from the Philistine land. They've got it on a cart, which God had told them, don't carry it on, a, don't put it on a cart. God said you're to put it on poles and carry it on poles. So they already messed up by putting it on a cart. They put it on a cart, an oxen is, is pulling the cart. The oxen stumbles. The ark's about to hit the ground, and Uzzah goes, no. He wants to do something good. He doesn't want the ark to hit the ground. And God kills him for it. He calculated that his hand was more holy than the dirt of the earth. And God killed him for his miscalculation. Here God says, he, God says here, I'm not going to kill them. You're going to kill them. God says, the one who violates this command, you are to kill them. And it's to be done in a specific way. They are to be stoned or shot with a 45. No. Uh, arrows. It's arrows. Okay. Sorry, Jay. You're not here, Jay. You know, I thought about a funny situation. Like, uh, I don't know why. Um, what if somebody touched the mountain and you had to stone them? And so you picked up a, a rock to stone him with, but the rock you picked up was on the mountain. That would be bad. Now, they're to be stoned or, or shot, and the reason they're to be killed this way is presumably because the people are not to lay a hand on them. Notice they're to be killed from a distance. God says, don't even touch that person. 
God says only when God sounds the trumpet could the people approach. Again, there's nothing special about the trumpet. It's not like the trumpet makes it easier to approach God. It's, it's just purely to teach the people that nobody approaches God without God say so. God is not some weak, passive father who's like a big teddy bear. He is a fearful God. A God that if we were to see right now, we would fall down and tremble. And yet, because of Jesus, Scripture teaches us, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. This is what Jesus has done for us. In the Old Testament, they couldn't even touch one little pebble on the mountain that God was dwelling on without having a boulder thrown at them to death. And yet now, because of the cross, because of the atoning work of Jesus, we not only get to touch the rocks, we not only get to climb the mountain, we not only get to approach the throne of God, we can approach the throne of God, get this, with boldness, with confidence, because of Jesus. Man, you imagine, like, I wouldn't even march into your home with boldness. And yet we march into the throne of God humbly, yet boldly because of Jesus Christ. I love what C.S. Lewis writes in Chronicles of Narnia. I, I almost asked Sam to read this because I feel like it should be read with a British accent. Uh, Aslan a man? Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the woods and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Miss Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Miss Beaver's telling you? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. God is not safe. God will call you to do things that will make you suffer. lose your life. He's not safe, but he is good. He is good. Make no mistake about it, God is good. Verse 14 to 15. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. In addition to washing their garments, Moses says, do not go near a woman. Now, I had so many jokes I wanted to use here, but since this is being recorded, I'm going to refrain. All right? I thought, best not. Why does Moses say, don't go near a woman? <laughs> what Moses means by this is that the people are to abstain from sexual relations. That's basically, that was the Hebrew idiom of saying, don't have sex. Now, we're not given the reason as to why they're to abstain from sexual relations. My best guess, and it's just a guess, is perhaps the same reason that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 7. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. So my guess is that this is perhaps a, a form of fasting from sex so that they can prepare themselves to meet with God. Now, here's the question for us. Do we prepare ourselves to meet with God? Have we ever considered fasting from the computer or our phones? Saturday night? Sunday morning? To meet with God? Just a thought. Verse 16 to 18. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the, mo uh, on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. 
Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it and fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. You know, now, uh, we just got back from uh, Mount Rainier on, on our retreat, as I said earlier, and, uh, you know, it was raining, so we didn't get to see it all that long. We didn't even get to see the, the peak of the mountain. But even still, even like just a, a piece of Mount Rainier, we were walking along, and it was just all this majesty. I mean, you look out, and you would just see, like, rocks and, 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 and just the expanse. I mean, it was just, it's just a majestic sight to, to see. And so I'm trying to imagine this scene. I want you to picture a scene. Imagine if, like, you were on this mountain, and you heard a scene, heard and saw a scene like this. All of a sudden there's thunder and lightning and thick clouds and trumpet blast and the mountain starts getting wrapped in smoke and fire and smoke's going up like the smoke of a kiln. You know, I imagine we wouldn't make it to the bathroom. The text says that the people trembled. I think we would too. Even the mountain itself trembled. I'm trying to imagine like standing at the base of this mountain, looking at all of this going on. We'd probably be like the lion uh, who runs out of the wizard, you know, and jumps through the window, just scared to death. And this is not merely an earthquake. This is not an earthquake. Hebrews 12, 26 tells us that it was God's voice that was shaking the mountain. That's the power of God. When God speaks, mountains literally, not metaphorically, literally shake. This is what happens when we come into the presence of a holy God. Texts like this, they're good reminders of the need for us to fear God. You know, I understand that the, like, fearing God is like, we often think of it as an Old Testament doctrine, right? Uh, but we have our fair share of passages in the New Testament that tell us to fear God. Bond servants, obey in everything, fearing the Lord. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. I hope that in an age of grace, we have not lost a sense of the fear of God. Our God is to be feared. Not scared of, feared. Verse 19. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. Now, I don't know why, but this sound of a, the trumpet getting louder and louder, for some reason, just I, I imagine it kind of being like that, that trumpet sound that Hans Zimmer makes in Inception. You know, the like, right? Like Hans Zimmer actually broke a, uh, a, a movie theater's speaker one time because he had so much bass in his uh, score. Uh, that's just how I hear it. And it gets louder and louder and louder. And if you ever wanted to know what does God's voice sound like? Thunder. What language does God speak? Thunder. He speaks the thunder language. Now, I, you know, we don't really get that sense in Seattle. If you've grown up in Seattle all your life and if you haven't ventured out much uh, to where it's hot, you really can't sense this. Growing up in the South, though, uh, where you would have constant heat and pressure changes, uh, you would get thunderstorms with thunder so loud it would literally scare you. You'd see this lightning flash and then immediately it would pop and it would be unbelievably loud, right? It would, it would cause you to jump. And just so we know how terrifying this was for the people, in the next chapter after Moses gets the Ten Commandments and he comes down to the people, here's what the people say to him. Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. They're like, Moses, you talk to us. Don't, don't, let, don't let him talk to us. That's how scared they are. Verse 20. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now, don't miss this phrase, that the Lord came down on Mount Sinai. Why is that important? Because the only way that man can ever approach God is that God has to approach us. He has to condescend himself 
to our level. I love a story that David Platt, uh, who's our, the president of the International Mission Board, which is our mission uh, sending agency in Southern Baptist Convention, I love what he t uh, the story he tells in his book called Radical. Here's what he writes. It'll be on the screen for you. I remember sitting outside a Buddhist temple in Indonesia. Men and women filled the elaborate, colorful temple grounds where they daily performed their religious rituals. Meanwhile, I was engaged in a conversation with a Buddhist leader and a Muslim leader in this particular community. They were discussing how all religions are fundamentally the same and only superficially different. We may have different views about small issues, one of them said, but when it comes down to essential issues, each of our religions is the same. I listened for a while, and then they asked me what I thought. I said, it sounds as though you both picture God, or whatever you call God, at the top of a mountain. And it seems as if you believe that we are at the bottom of the mountain. And I may take one route up the mountain, and you may take another, and in the end, we will all end up in the same place. They smiled as I spoke. Happily, they replied, exactly, you understand. And then I leaned in and said, now let me ask you a question. What would you think if I told you that the God at the top of the mountain actually came down to where we are? What would you think if I told you that God doesn't wait for people to find their way to him, but instead he comes to us? They thought for a moment and then they responded, that would be great. And I replied, let me introduce you to Jesus. You see, all religions and philosophies are basically surrounding around this idea of man's attempt to reach something. Muslims trying to get to Allah, Buddhists trying to reach Nirvana, Greeks trying to please the gods, atheists trying to live for self and society. What makes our God unique and unbelievably special is that God knows that we can never approach him. We will never find him. We will never make it to him. And so he comes to us. He descends to us. Just as God descended to Moses on top of Mount Sinai, God descends to us in the form of Jesus Christ, his son, to talk to us. He makes it possible for us, like Moses, to talk to him face to face. Jesus has made it possible to approach the unapproachable. And then in verse 21 to 25, our last passage this morning. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. And God tells Moses one more time, go warn the people, even though you've warned them multiple times, warn them one more time, don't come up here. Now we don't know, why would somebody do that anyway? Right? Why do they need so many warnings? I'm guessing maybe just out of pure foolishness or maybe pure curiosity. Perhaps they want a, a, a special knowledge of the holy. And God says, warn them one more time that if they do this, they will perish. If you remember in 1 Samuel 6, when they brought the ark back, when the ark was returned from Israel, it says that 70 men looked inside the ark. I mean, can you imagine, like, if we, fa if we ever find the ark, do not look inside it. All right? I don't think we're going to find it, but... Imagine if we found the ark, and they're curious. They want to look inside. Seventy men look inside, and God killed all 70 of them. That's why the Philistines sent it back. The Philistines said, take it. We don't want this thing. It's too powerful. We can't handle it. Take it. It's yours. Here we have the same idea. God is telling the people that they cannot stand in my presence. My holiness, my glory will obliterate them. They can't take it. God said even the priests may consecrate themselves. It didn't matter how spiritual, how mature your office. It didn't matter. Nobody could stand in the presence of God. And if they do, God says he will break out against them. 
God reminds Moses of this twice, uh, once more in verse 24b. Twice God uses this phrase, don't do this lest I break out against you. Now what does that mean? The Hebrew there for break out against is this idea of like bursting forth. All right. God says, don't come near me or my glory will burst upon you and obliterate you. So let me close with an illustration. Could you, cause it's some, for me, when I was reading through this, I was like, what does that mean? What does it mean for God's glory to just... Think of it like this. I'll close with this illustration, all right? Imagine if the Pacific Ocean was above our head and we were underneath it. And at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, there was one drain. And there was a cork holding up all that water. Now, do you know how much water is in the Pacific Ocean? 187 quintillion gallons of water. Uh, here's what that number looks like. That's a rough estimate of how many gallons of water is in the Pacific Ocean. And imagine if one day you were curious and you're like, hey, what do you think that cork does? Let's pull it out and see. No, don't do it. Man, I'm curious. And so you pull it out. And all 187 quintillion gallons of water immediately would kill you. Because you can't drink that much water. You're not fit to drink that kind of water. Unless you're Ben Stevens. Uh, you can't handle it. But there was somebody who could. One day God sent his son and he took that cork off and he drank every last drop of God's wrath. You see that Pacific Ocean is filled with wrath. Pure, pure, holy wrath. And Jesus drank every last drop. And now... He's filled the ocean with something else. You know what he's filled the ocean with? Blood. And he comes to you and he says, you have a choice. Here's a cork. You can go stand under this drain and be washed and washed and washed and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Or you can take your cork and plug it back and say, no, thank you. Only this time, you're not averting the wrath of God. You're averting the salvation of God. Out of pride, out of self-sufficiency, out of disbelief, out of whatever you want to call it, many take that cork and plug it back and say, I don't need it. Just as Moses and the people could only approach God in the way that God specified, so now God says, you may only approach me in the way that I have specified. And the way that I have specified is to come through the blood of Jesus. That's the only way you may approach me. To wash our filthy rags. You know what happens? You say, well, earlier when you said, well, how do I consecrate these filthy rags? How do I make them clean? You get under the drain and you be washed and washed and washed and washed. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. Every wrong thought, feeling, thing that you've ever done in your life is immediately washed and made clean. And it's an endless supply. It will never run dry, ever. This morning, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And the, the, the grape juice that we're going to drink is a symbol, is a, a memory of that blood that is offered to us. If you're here this morning and you have given your life to Jesus Christ and have trusted in Him, you've been baptized, we invite you to partake of the Lord's Supper. 
to, to eat the bread and to drink the cup that symbolizes the body and blood of Jesus, if you have not given your life to Jesus, if you have not been baptized, we do ask that you refrain from taking it, but we do invite you to pray along with us and to really consider, do I need to be washed in the blood? Am I banking on approaching God because I'm a good person or I've, he'll forgive me? You can give your life to Jesus right now, today. You can make a choice to surrender everything and give it over to him. I pray you would. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that there would be two things that we would leave here today with. Um, a sense of the, the almighty fear that, that you have in your glory and your holiness and a sense of the almighty grace that you offer. Lord, I, I know that it's difficult to balance those two sometimes, to, to, to have the right perspective of how do we, how do we uh, revere you and respect you and, and, and have a holy fear of you, but also know that <clears throat> Jesus has made it possible for us to, to just boldly approach and to, to talk to you in prayer and to, to come up the mountain and speak to you. Um, God, I pray that you would help us to balance that tension well that you would help us to, to realize that we can approach the unapproachable. I pray for those this morning who have not given their lives to you, Lord, that they would, they would see their need to, to be cleansed, to be consecrated, to be made pure and holy. I thank you, God, for making yourself available to us. Thank you for not waiting for us to find you, but coming and finding us. Thank you for being the good shepherd who comes and finds the one who's run away. We love you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.